Well, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I know we're running a minute or two late, but thank you to everyone who is joining us virtually. Um, we appreciate your attendance and we hope you'll enjoy the, the panel. The purpose of the workshop is to highlight analog programs in the United States and the research being performed in those analogs and we'll also discuss important directions for the future of analog research. Um, I'm going to, um, I'm Kristen Miller, I'm going to be moderating the panel today and handling all of the questions in the chat. Um, I want to introduce our our illustrious panel. We're really um, pleased to have everyone here with us. So first off, we have um, Travis Nelson from the University of North Dakota. Travis is a PhD student and instructor in the um, UND School of Aerospace Sciences. And along with Dr. Pablo de Leon, Travis manages the daily operations of the Inflatable Lunar Mars Analog Habitat, or ILMA, on the UND campus for the uh, Human Space Flight Laboratory. So Travis, welcome and thanks for being here representing Elmo, we appreciate it. Thank you. Um, next, we have uh, Thomas Potts, who is the Associate Director of Research for Florida International University's Medina Aquarius Program. And Tom has been with Aquarius since it relocated from St. Croix in the U.S. Virgin Islands to Key Largo, Florida in 1993. He has a Master of Science degree in Marine Biology and was an aquanaut on the fourth saturation mission aboard, aboard Aquarius after its redeployment on the country. And in uh, 2010, Tom became the director of Aquarius and led the transition of the program from UNCW to FIU in 2013. Um, welcome, Tom. We're so glad you're here with us. Glad to um, be here. Joining Tom is Roger Garcia, who is the Aquarius Operations Director and Diving Safety Officer. He is a veteran of 20 years of diving operations with the U.S. Navy, that's really impressive, and has been with Aquarius Reef Base since 2003. He is responsible for overseeing diving operations and assuring the safety of all participants. Uh, Roger, welcome. We're so glad to have Aquarius represented on the panel. Thank you. Happy to be here. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, next up, we have Scott Van Hoy. Scott is an AMU graduate student in aerospace science, and he is the APUS Analog Research Group Program Manager. And more than that, he is really, truly the program founder as well. Um, he's an outstanding student, and here representing ARC. Um, welcome, Scott. Thanks for being here. It's great to be here. Thank you, Dr. Miller. And we also have Terry Trevino, who has a Master of Science degree in Space Studies with a concentration in Aerospace Science. Terry is an analog astronaut. He is an exoplanet hunter and the assistant manager of the Wallace E. Boston Observatory, which is located on the APUS campus. Uh, Terry's joining us from Paris today at a conference. Welcome, Terry. Thanks for making time for this. Hopefully he's here with us. <laughs> Wait a minute, he's not until later in, in the panel. And finally, we have, um, we're have we super honored to have uh, Dr. Arnold Nikogosian with us on the panel. Um, Arnold is an adjunct faculty and former distinguished research professor and director of the Center for Study of International Medical Policies and Practices at the SCAR School of Public Policy and Government at George Mason University. He developed and taught the graduate concentration and certificate, Global Challenges and Threats in Medical Policy. He served as the NASA Associate Administrator for Life and Microgravity Sciences, designated agency health and safety official, chief medical officer, and senior advisor for health affairs. He's currently a part-time faculty member at APUS. Thank you, Arnold, for being with us today. We're really glad to have you here. Um, and uh, we'll go ahead and get started with the panel. We're going to start off with a presentation on ILMA first. So I'll turn the time over to you, Travis. Oh, and if everyone could, um, we're going to have questions at the end. So if you want to drop questions into the chat or into the Q&A, we'll be monitoring both. Thank you. Okay. My stopwatch started. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Travis Nelson. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of North Dakota. Um, again, honored to be part of the panel today with, uh, uh, with the group. So um, I'll be talking to you about the inflatable lunar Martian analog habitat. Um, here it is. Um, it is uh, a part of the Space Studies Department here at UND Aerospace, and we've been an operating lunar Mars planetary analog uh, for nearly nine years. Um, these three individual systems that you see in the pictures are connected. Uh, the modules are connected to the rover. The rover is connected to the spacesuits. Uh, so that provides 
a concept designed to avoid interior contamination while still allowing plenty of uh, accessibility to the outside world uh, while they're staying inside of the habitat. Um, so that was one of the initial goals of the mission was um, preventing contamination similar to the Apollo missions where, you know, harmful lunar regolith could be brought back uh, into the habitable volume. Speaking of habitable volume, our system is about 17,000 cubic feet, um, so roughly 40% the size of the International Space Station, which gives our, um, our crews a fair amount of room to work and live during their time there. In terms of the environment, uh, North Dakota, as many of you uh, can assume, is cold, so it's not uncommon to see temperatures 40 below zero Celsius and potentially staying below negative 18 Celsius for weeks at a time. Um, so other than December through February, it's quite nice up here, um, but we try to try to push into the cold months of the year with our analog. Um, so yeah, you can see here the rover, uh, you can see the suits, which we'll uh, get another glance at later and how they connect to the rover and other portions of the habitat. Uh, on the yellow, Arrow is the core module. Uh, next would be the science module and exercise module. Our following modules are the EVA workshop and the plant production module, each of which I will pay just brief lip service to um, kind of as we, as we go through the systems. Here's another shot of the rover um, as it undocks from the habitat via the docking port mechanism and allows them to traverse about 11 acres of land uh, near the habitat. We have completed 12 missions to date, uh, right from 2013 to 2022, with two missions planned this fall, actually one starting next week with ARG-3, so we're really excited about that. Um, our durations, as of now, have ranged from 10 to 30 days, and we hope to push to 45 and 60 days um, in the future. Our crews, um, are usually comprised of three to four people, and uh, that is what the, the habitat was designed to support. Um, just talking a little bit about the infrastructure and capabilities that make ELMA unique, uh, we have suit docking port mechanisms, um, which allow for ease of donning and doffing of the suits, as well as maintenance and storage. Um, we've pushed EVAs all the way to the four hour mark with, uh, with onboard uh, portable life support systems um, within the contained within the suit. Um, we also have the rover exploration with the capability of sample return via a sample return box. Um, and all of that kind of on the EVA side gives us a, a strong capability in in situ scientific processing and standard operations um, on the planetary surface. Um, Furthermore, ILMA is, is aiming to be a significant analog specializing in cognitive performance and psychology, um, testing equipment, developing standard operating procedures, also a common theme. Uh, the inside, as we could start with the core module, uh, is comprised of their main habitation area, uh, communications, full bathroom and shower, uh, galley, eating area, um, and four bunks, which on the bottom left picture, you can see one of them. Not overly spacious, but uh, sufficient um, for our crews. Moving over to the science module, um, this is where crews complete experiments in geology and microbiology sampling, um, processing, and classification. The actual Retrieval of samples is important to learn. So with Apollo blueprinted tools from Kennedy Space Center and some 3D printed tools of our own, uh, we work to uh, retrieve pristine samples and then actually process them with inside the habitat. Um, we have microbiology standard operating procedures, which allow people to take a sample, plate them on the agar plate, incubate them, and eventually enumerate them to see um, all of the fun microorganisms that that we know grow. And that's an effort for uh, finding future life on, on another planet, the moon or Mars, let's say. Uh, in terms of equipment, we have an autoclave 
agar plating capabilities, uh, a lab incubator and centrifuge, as well as a compound microscope. So we're able to uh, document and collect that data on site. Um, so when a crew comes to Elma, you know, whether they're versed in science or not, we have SOPs available um, to walk them through some of the various experiments. And uh, I'm just paying a, a small bit of lip service to the fraction of science being done with uh, some of our graduate students and professionals alike. The exercise performance module um, is green for a reason, right? Kind of getting away from that monotony of aluminum and white and uh, gray shades. Um, we have the exercise performance module. In the other end of the module, we have a med bay. Um, so all of your normal equipment uh, for taking vitals generally three times per day. Um, crews provide cortisol sampling. And this provides a place to do yoga, meditation, exercise, or whatever the mission profile calls for. Next up, we have the EVA module. And up on top, um, some of my favorite people from mission number 10 last spring. Um, but this is the EVA module. Uh, this is a second means to store the suits. So we have a total of four um, suit ports that can support all four crew members in suits if needed. Um, this also serves as an airlock. So kind of, again, mitigating harmful contamination of, of bringing things inside under at least a controlled means. Um, the purpose of this module was for suit research, um, a place for soldering, ultrasonic welding, maintenance, and other tasks. In the middle, you see here even just workstations for our cognitive batteries that our, our, um, our crews often complete wearing an EEG headset. So we're, we're mapping neural networks of learning, essentially. Um, you might notice on a few of these slides that in the top picture, there is a kind of a crude CAD drawing of each of these modules. And it's important to note that these were designed and much of the work apart from main infrastructure and utilities was completed by graduate students. Um, so it's a great learning and educational tool in that regard. By far, one of the most popular in recent years is the plant production module. Um, in the plant production module, we have always had kind of this idea of mixing Martian or lunar regolith with soil in different concentrations and quantities um, in order to see what grows. Uh, we have had groups germinate, harvest, and consume various types of microgreens, tomatoes, lettuce uh, during our missions. Ultimately, we know that helps with saving mass and, and its situ it's resource utilization. Apart from some of the activities listed on the screen, we measure VOCs, um, so a combination of gases and odors emitted, um, CO2 levels, um, research on hypercapnia, and um, different toxins and chemicals you may find in, in everyday products. Additionally, psychological wellness, uh, that, that's been a big push um, in these past few years, is we know that plants assist in terms of positive psychological effects and, and wellness. Um, so that's where we've been focusing in terms of scaling up our capabilities to provide as much plant life in the module as possible, and then to, uh, tracking that data over time. And a few others listed here. Um, the suits are always a strong point of the system, Dr. DeLeon. Uh, is really the originator and director uh, of this system um, and primarily the suits that we have here at UND. So we have uh, multiple models of suits. This is the NDX2 AT, so the North Dakota Experimental 2, and the AT stands for Analog Trainer. Um, so this provides us a good way to get outside, um, collect things, and then safely get back inside. Critical contingency scenarios, I've heard a lot of, of that today. Um, surface sampling, a few of the other activities that we do um, in, in support of future lunar and Martian activity. Uh, just highlighting a few of the um, more recent research that has been going on at ILMA. Um, we've been actively using time delays in our past two missions uh, with hopes of continuing it in all missions moving forward. Um, currently, we have a 10 minute one day time delay set for next week. Um, in the ARG-3 mission and the following mission, which will be ILMA-3, 
14, we'll have a 20 minute one day, one way time delay, um, which is really great for the, the fidelity of communications and um, that isolation and confinement. Uh, we have a 32 channel EEG, which I mentioned among other various wearables and sensor packages, um, all contributing to theses and, and dissertations here at UND and in the professional world. Um, environmental monitoring okay, via those, those similar sensors. Um, psychology and cognitive research, as I mentioned, um, and EVA drone operations while wearing an EEG in a spacesuit. Um, so we think that is, is fairly unique um, in terms of our capability. Um, but yeah, we offer a student involvement uh, as well as pre professional collaboration. Um, and it's nice to see uh, people come and go through the system and um, provide data and feedback, of course, so we can ultimately turn up fidelity um, and make it a better analog. With that, I will be happy to take any questions. I think at the end, Dr. Miller mentioned, um, and I can also potentially check the chat, which looks looks okay. Um, so I'll take any questions at the end, and um, that's it for me. I'll leave you with two pictures of three of my favorite astronauts, um, astronaut Doug Hurley and astronaut Karen Nyberg, um, and astronaut uh, Lawrence DeLucas there on the right. So thank you for your time, and I look forward to the questions and the rest of the panel. Thank you so much, Travis. That was an excellent presentation. Oma is such an amazing facility, and uh, we appreciate you being here and giving us an overview of, of all of the amazing things that you can do with this habitat. So thank you for being here and for your time. Yes, glad to be here. Thanks so much. Awesome. Okay, we are, I'm going to do all the questions at the end so we can have, um, and hopefully have time for a real discussion then. So we're going to go ahead um, with the presentation on Aquarius by um, Thomas Potts and Roger Garcia. And we'll let you take it away. Yeah, great. Thanks, Kristen. Um, I'm going to stop my video just because the internet connection here lags a little bit. So I think it'll move a little bit quicker if I don't have it. Okay, there we go. All right, so um, Roger Garcia and I are here um, today to talk a little bit about Aquarius. And um, Aquarius Reef Base has supported over 150 missions uh, since its inception in, in 1988. Um, but what we wanna do today is sort of take uh, some time to talk about our opportunity, our, our collaboration with NASA, more specifically, you know, how and why Aquarius is used as a space analog to train astronauts. Um, some of the reasons that the uh, NASA Extreme Environment Mission Operations, or NEMO, is successful is that it melds science, technology development, extreme environment training, and education into a, a seamless package. So when we, when we started working with that, uh, NASA, we had to answer a, a, a pretty basic question in you know, what makes a good analog. And you know, for us, it's important to start with the, uh, the systems and the procedures. And then once we do that, we'll, we'll go ahead and, and talk a little bit about NASA and how they've used Aquarius. So the, uh, the Medina Aquarius Reef Base Program consists of a shore base operations center and an Aquari Aquarius habitat system. The uh, shore base op center is here located in Isla Mirada, Florida. Um, and it's about eight and a half miles from Aquarius. The operations center serves as mission control where specialists oversee all aspects of what's conducted at Aquarius. And then um, the Aquarius undersea habitat is a remote saturation system um, deployed in, in about 60 feet of water at Conk Reef. Um, a life support buoy floating on the surface above the habitat contains generators, compressors, and telecommunications equipment. Now the shore base operations center houses the watch desk, which, um, which directs and monitors everything that happens at Aquarius. Um, it also has a, a classroom, boat docks, dive locker, and a, hyper chair, a hyperbaric chamber, um, recompression chamber. Now moving offshore, more directly above the habitat is the LSB or life support buoy. And that provides pro power, air, and telecommunications to Aquarius. Um, the LSB is linked to, to the habitat um, by an umbilical that consists of air hoses, power lines, and, and data cables. 
Now the habitat itself is 43 feet long, nine feet in diameter and consists of a wet porch where divers enter and exit the lab and two locks that can be independently pressurized. The entry lock contains the marine head and most of the marine uh, mission specific equipment. Um, and the main lock is the main living area that contains a galley and bunks for six. Um, six aquanauts can spend uh, days to weeks aboard Aquarius without having to surface. This is the entry porch with the moon pool. As you can see down here behind me, this is where we enter and exit the habitat from. This is where we store our diving equipment. This is where we have all of the uh, air connections. And it also serves up as our shower. Next, we get to the entry lock, which serves as an airlock with the two slidable doors. It also has a hygiene station where we can brush our teeth. And most importantly, our comm station where we can talk to the divers who are out on TVA and with Mission Control Center topside. Stepping further into the habitat, we get to the galley where we can prepare our food. We have a small table for eating where Suichi and Kate are sitting. Hey guys. Hi. And all the electronics for controlling the habitat. And last but not least, we have our bunk room with six bunks for the six people. On board Aquarius, there's not a lot of room as you can see, but plenty for sleeping. So uh, Aquarius can be used in a variety of operating modes depending on the mission objectives, uh, the project time limitations, diving skill and expertise of team members, and, and maybe most importantly, you know, the budget availability of, of the client. Um, since our time is limited, um, you know, we won't go into detail um, about saturation diving, the physics and the decompression theory that go into it. Um, Roger Garcia is an expert on it and he'll be glad to take questions at the end. But in a nutshell, uh, sat diving involves, you know, gas solubility and the effects of pressure. In, in essence, you know, the deeper a diver goes, the longer he or she stays at depth, the more nitrogen or other inert gas uh, he or she absorbs. So if you couple that with Henry's law, which dictates that divers who remain at a certain depth will stop taking on additional inert gas. Um, the advantages of this is that once your tissues are saturated, uh, the time required for, for decompression will be the same no matter how long a diver stays underwater, sort of like pushing a sponge in a bucket of water. It will only absorb so much. So, um, you know, after a mission, you know, we can only return to the surface uh, by allowing the gas uh, to slowly come out of the tissues and be exhaled away. You know, the time required for this to happen is a function of depth. And since aquanauts inside Aquarius are at about two and a half atmospheres, this decompression process uh, takes about 16 hours. Now, there are two main advantages to saturation diving over standard scuba diving. One is uh, it gives you the gift of time. So uh, any divers who are, are watching this know that uh, diving from the surface down to about 95 feet using air or an oxygen enriched mixed gas, you have about an hour's worth of work on the bottom uh, over a 24 hour period. Um, divers compare that with divers, diver uh, saturation divers from Aquarius, you get about 540 minutes of bottom time at those depths, so about a tenfold increase in productivity. Now, the, uh, the other main advantage uh, is there's an increased safety margin um, uh, from working um, out of Aquarius. First is, you know, all operations are directed by, a, a, you know, a professional staff with over 80 years of collective uh, experience working with SAT dive systems. And secondly, all, under, all aquanauts undergo a rigorous aquanaut training program to ensure that they understand all the elements of, of sat diving. And then by, by diving from Aquarius, um, you know, aquanauts reduce some of the most hazardous parts of a dive, uh, namely making multiple trips through the water column over, uh, over an extended period. And finally, Aquarius has redundant systems in place to safeguard the integrity of the mission, you know, if there is any potential equipment failure. Now, since saturation diving is more advanced than no decompression diving from the surface, uh, typ uh, typical training lasts anywhere from five to six days, and, and divers must possess certain qualifications before actually be considering an aquanaut candidate. 
Now, the nice thing about Aquarius is, um, you know, not every mission aboard Aquarius requires 24 access to the environment. Uh, you know, for projects re requiring extended time uh, inside the habitat without making excursions or EVAs in the case of NASA, teams you can use the Aquarius in, in one atmosphere mode. In one ATA, divers are sequestered inside the hab and uh, the internal pressure is brought back to surface. And these dives can typically last anywhere from two to six hours. Um, and this is especially useful for real-time testing of sensors, equipment or protocols, conducting live outreach events or, or project, project development prior to launching a full SAT mission. Uh, additionally, the training uh, for a one ATA is reduced from, from about five days to, to about two hours. And the cost is about a sixth of what it is to run a saturation mission, um, roughly about $3,500 a day versus $21,000 a day. And for those teams that don't need sat diving or one ATA ops, we do have um, discrete visits um, that can be made to, to Aquarius. You know, in some instances, two 50-minute dives over, over the course of a, multiple days is all that's needed to conduct outreach events or to, um, you know, test the, test the equipment or sensors. And these typically run about, um, about $2,000 a day, um, uh, depending on the, the services and the equipment needed. Now, NASA has been able to capitalize on the advantages of sat diving and other operations um, to use Aquarius very effectively as a analog um, to space exploration. Now, since 2001, NASA used uh, Aquarius to prepare for near-term and future exploration to asteroids, Mars, and, and the moon. And by using Aquarius, uh, studies are completed more quickly and less expensively while retaining the psychological benefits astronauts get by working in extreme environments that still carry a measure of human safety risk. Now, since um, um, while well, NASA analogs can be, can be found in a variety of locations, oceanic environments often tend to provide the most realistic experiences. Additionally, uh, Aquarius has the added advantage of being comparable in physical dimension to the Destiny Lab aboard the ISS. Um, also, Aquarius and the ISS have crew complements of six that live, eat, sleep, and uh, in constant contact with one another. Now, um, there, there's three primary reasons why um, Aquarius is considered, uh, we like to consider it the perfect analog for space training. First of all, um, the operations are not simulated. You know, once a crew commits to saturation, there's no departure without compromising the integrity of the entire mission. So this requires that the aquanauts go through intensive classroom training and field training to ensure that diving methods and procedures become almost routine so that they, they can focus on accomplishing the, the science and the research priorities. Um, plus the crew members also know that there's inherent risk and errors have real consequences so that better prepares them psychologically for, for space mission. Secondly, offshore and onshore, uh, ARB has a highly developed infrastructure that includes communications, telemetry, and video. All operations aboard Aquarius and in the water are carefully coordinated through various forms of communication, controlled and monitored by the watch desk uh, supervisor back here on shore. Um, four to eight video cameras located inside Aquarius and on the reef monitor every aspect of the operation and stream real time back to the watch desk and to the internet um, via a live link um, aboard the LSB. And this, is a, this is valuable for not only um, monitoring the progress and the safety of the team, but provides great uh, opportunities for education, live education and outreach events. And as I mentioned before, you know, the Aquarius has a highly trained support staff uh, proficient in running in these extreme environment missions. Two habitat technicians embed with the Aquanaut team. Um, and they sort of serve as the eyes and the ears in the operation of the watch director um, in, in the water inside Aquarius. And staff awful also facilitates, you know, the production of quality programming from, uh, we've had uh, live links from ISS to Aquarius uh, to field trips with students around, around the world. Um, now, some of the reasons NASA use, utilizes Aquarius as an analog is that working underwater is the closest environment to space for non-SIM training. Um, NEMA was developed by an astronaut training specialist as a multi-objective mission analog for long duration space flight. 
Now, four primary objectives are typically addressed to some degree during every NEMO mission. Uh, life sciences typically address uh, astronaut uh, to astronaut interpersonal behavior, um, how humans deal with isolation, confinement, stress, um, nutritional demands, uh, requirements, and best ways to deliver calories, effective use of shared space, and ways to incorporate technology to enable phys physicians uh, working th thousands of miles away to perform um, procedures or guide procedures. Hardware development um, is a critical component of every NEMO mission, especially uh, since uh, a lot of the equipment prototypes and natural concepts are refined uh, in a relatively controlled environment. And this ranges from wireless position to exercise countermeasures and training tools and software. To test exploration concepts, spacewalks are simulated undersea by using a device that replicates varying levels of gravity to see how astronauts respond to gravitational forces on the moon, Mars, and, and even an asteroid. You know, astronauts also engage in construction tasks since they will be required to build infrastructure necessary to support long-term deployment on extraterrestrial bodies. And as with any well-planned expedition, protocols and equipment um, need to be developed and perfected to help uh, any in incapacitated crew member. And finally, since astronauts will rely on robots and, and machines to help achieve all their objectives in space, aquanauts practice using and engaging with crawlers, AUVs, ROVs to obtain samples, conduct exploration, transport to humans across alien and landscapes, deliver tools and provide real-time communication. So we're, we're really proud of our association with NASA, um, you know, just, uh, just recently in 21 and 22, a number of our NEMO aquanauts have spent time aboard the space station. So um, both Roger and I will be available to take any, any questions um, at the end. Thank you so much, that was an amazing. Uh, introduction to Aquarius and all of the incredible science that you're able to do there. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, and we will have the questions at the end. Um, we're going to move on now to um, hear from Scott Van Hoy on uh, the APUS Analog Research Group. Hey, everybody. My name is Scott Van Hoy. I'm the program manager as well as a graduate student at APUS for, and also for the uh, APUS uh, Analog Research Group. So we've heard some really cool things about what the University of North Dakota and Florida International University are doing uh, with their analog facilities, Aquarius and ILMA. So what we've been able to do here at APUS is utilize their facilities and create partnerships in order to get students involved with analog habitats and research. So about two years ago, we started the APUS Analog Research Group, uh, which initially was looking into the Mars Desert Research Station and then eventually branched out to other facilities as well. So here on the first slide, you see um, the NDX2AT suit from uh, the University of North Dakota and with our background for the A3 logo for APUS. So what's really cool about the APS Analog Research Group is that we're a student-run, faculty-supported online program which trains students to work as both crew members and also mission support for terrestrial space analogs. So what that means is that we, uh, by partnering with MDRS or ILMA or Aquarius, we're able to bring students into the research and the management fold to get real-world hands-on experience uh, with working with these facilities. So we are extracurricular, which means that we're not part of any specific course. And also students have the opportunity to be analog astronauts, which means they actually go to the facility or they can be researchers, such as sending a project to the, uh, to the facility with the analog astronauts to complete. And also our management team is students as well. So that means that our flight directors, deputy flight directors, risk managers, operations specialists, everybody that fits into the fold to actually create one of these missions is a student as well. So what's really cool about this is as we've grown, we now have like a program staff component, which means that we have people working, but we have a full research coordination team, a full recruitment team. Uh, we have a safety department, we have a training department, and that is all just to support the multiple analog missions and programs that we're working with. So right now we have about 30 
uh, active students who are in the APUS Analog Research Group. And then that is led by Dr. Miller. And then we also have some other faculty advisors as well. So it's really been a cool integrated effort uh, over the past couple of years to bring student learning opportunities to APUS. So today we've had two missions with our third one going to ILMA here in just about a week. So our first mission was uh, AARG-1, which I heard Travis allude to a little bit with some of his pictures. Uh, then we had ARG-2I, which was ILMA as well. And then ARG-3I is coming up, which will be another mission at ILMA. So I'll talk a little bit more about each mission and then also the future missions we have coming up at different facilities. So ARG-1I was almost a year ago now, and it was 10 days in ILMA, and it was an experimental mission. So we just wanted to try to work out how is this, how is this going to work at a fully online university? How are we going to bring students together and faculty together to create a mission completely virtually and then take it to the University of North Dakota to accomplish um, a mission with four people who have never met each other except for online presentations and, uh, and Zoom meetings? So that was kind of an experimental mission, trying to get a feel for procedures and risk management and everything that goes into conducting a mission like this. So for the first mission, we had two APUS faculty members and then two APUS graduate students go. And then we also published the mission summary in the CSUNF journal. So if you want to read the mission summary for that, it is uh, published in uh, the most recent edition of CISA and it's on their website to check out. So the second mission, which is ARG-2I, and the way we ended up labeling these, uh, starting with the second mission, is ARG is Analog Research Group. Uh, I stands for ILMA, and two is our second mission at that facility. So this was a 14-day mission. Uh, at this point, we figured out kind of some lessons learned from the uh, from the first mission. So a team of students came together, and we were like, hey, what did we learn from the first one that we can do better at the second one? So we implemented those lessons learned, and then we sent four APOS graduate students to ILMA to live in the facility for 14 days. And one of our uh, our crew commander for that mission was uh, Terry Trevino, and he was actually a mission specialist on the first mission and came back as the crew commander for the second. So it's all about just maintaining those lessons learned and really just spreading the mentorship from mission to mission. So I mentioned we have the ARG-3I mission that's coming up. I don't have a slide for that one because it's uh, also going to be a 14-day mission at OMA. And what we're working on now is to use those lessons learned to increase fidelity. So now we're really uh, trying to figure out the, the, communic the communications aspects of the time delay for a Mars mission. And so we're working on increasing the fidelity to lead into some of the future missions that we have with other facilities. So in January, we were slotted or we are slotted for our first mission to send seven students to the Mars Desert Research Station in Hanksville, Utah. And so that will be a 14-day uh, mission in the Utah desert, uh, which that MDRS is owned by the Mars Society, which they do rotational missions every, every single year. So they do uh, two weeks, and every year they'll have, I think, between 10 and 15 missions that they'll conduct. So being in the desert with limited availability of, uh, of resources, limited water availability, and it's the next town over, and then also um, having the desert environment to use as a terrain analog is definitely going to be a great opportunity for us to blend some of the research studies we have at ILMA with MDRS. So Terry will talk a little bit about the research that we're doing here in a few minutes. Um, but one of the things that makes AARG really unique is by utilizing different facilities, uh, we can run the same experiments in different environments and different living conditions to try to get a better idea of uh, the results of these research projects. Also ILMA, our plan for the near future is to continue uh, with doing two missions per year at ILMA. And for every mission that is for uh, either students or faculty, yeah, either the undergraduate, graduate, or faculty level that can participate in those missions. And then every single mission will have a support team of usually about 10 or so students will rotate in and out of uh, positions for the support team for an ILMA mission. And then what we're really excited about is, um, is we're partnering with Tom and Roger to do a January 2024 Aquarius Reef Base mission. And this will be five crew members um, at both the faculty and the student level uh, who will live in Aquarius for right now we're planning on four days. And so what we're hoping to do is take all the competencies that we've learned from the analog facilities for ILMA and MDRS and all the risk management that we learned for a space analog mission uh, and plus the recurring research studies that we have and test that 
and uh, in the excellent analog environment that is Aquarius. So we're really excited about the Aquarius mission coming up in January 2024. So I kept the overview a little bit short. Um, so I'm just gonna finish up with the more involvement we have, the better. So any APOS students and faculty are welcome to join and we would love to have you. There's a researcher applying for the, uh, to be an analog astronaut or to help out with the management. So not we don't just have like research coordinators, or like one person that's in charge of these jobs. We have entire teams of students who are helping out uh, to push these missions forward and, and to make these missions a success. So if you want to get involved, there's definitely a place for you at AARG and to work with these awesome facilities that are uh, that we're partnered with. Also, we're open to outside partnerships that enhance student learning. So if you're watching this and you're not a member of APUS, it doesn't mean that you can't get involved, but um, we are pretty limited in the opportunities that we have for outside involvement. But we would definitely love to hear how you want to get involved and how we can help you with that. And to learn more or to get involved, you can email apus.arg at gmail.com. And that will give uh, that will be a direct line to us, either me or Dr. Miller. And we can get back to you about more about the program and help you achieve your goals for whatever that may be in the analog world. So with that, I'll kick it over to Terry Trevino, who will talk a little bit more about the, uh, the analog research that we have going on within AARG. Thank you so much, Scott. That was excellent. Scott's, um, you just can't say enough good about his leadership and program management skills and what he has done for the ARC program. We are really lucky to have him. Um, Terry is having some connectivity issues. Daniel, if you can hear me, I don't know if you're there. Yes, I can yes, hear you. He is in the um, the regular group of participants. He couldn't get back into the presenter room. So he's me, in there as a phone number. It starts with 415. Is there any way we can let him speak and I can share his slides? Yes. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> okay, he can now speak. Okay, Terry, I'm going to share the slides and hope that, that you can speak here. Um, how do I? Okay, this is on. I use Google Docs. How do I, is there a way to go full screen on Google Docs? Does anybody know this? Uh, if you move your cursor to the bottom, you should, oh, it's Google Docs. Google, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to do that. Okay, well, sure. we've got them on here at least. Um, I can page through them for you, Terry. Can you? Um, yeah, Terry, can I'm you here see? ready when you okay. are. Okay. Oh, perfect. Okay, take it away. Go ahead. Yeah, and I have my slides up. It just has a terrible reception, so I went to 3G. Uh, uh, bonsoir from Paris and the International Astronautical Conference. Uh, tremendous experience. Uh, really here tonight to talk about some of the research that that I've been allowed uh, to perform through uh, really through my relationship and, and friendship and partnership with Dr. Miller and Dr. Albine and, and uh, Scott for allowing me to you know in some of these missions. And uh, yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm, I'm excited about where this is heading. Uh, the science itself is, is pretty fantastic. And, um, you know, the, I, I'm gonna just move right into that. So we are, here we go, Analog Mission Science, AARG, here we are. Uh, next slide, Dr. Miller. Uh, real simple stuff, guys. I'm not gonna get crazy and fancy, sorry, uh, y'all. Space human factors, it's really uh, what we work on in all these missions. I'm definitely the astrobiology side of this. I really enjoy doing plants and pretending that I'm in space. Uh, my my partner, she says that uh, I'm uh, I'm in a big space camp for adults, but uh, we'll just we'll just stick with that. I like that. Uh, we practice our EVA regularly. I've been on many extravehicular activities outside of the HAB, and uh, of course, have performed many me mental health uh, studies. You know, it really leads to us you know, simply stating since it's sleep and crew harmony are the, probably some of the most important things that you can get on a mission. Uh, set of slides, excuse me, set, set of images here. The image upper left is a, uh, is a, it's a microalgae, it's a cyanobacteria. It's, uh, it is a bacteria. We use that. Uh, Kind of a, a, an understanding really how it will do it was, a, it was a really interesting concept we would transfer 
that orig original algae from Hawaii, which is where this is based, Cyanotech is our, our sponsor on the, one of that part of that project. They mailed that through the mail to the University of North Dakota. And from the University of North Dakota, I took that and, and grew it into these 10 uh, Erlenmeyer flasks full of um, uh, cyanobacteria. It's Arthrospira, Arthrospira platensis, and we call it A platensis. Amazingly hardy, uh, edible, thin cellular walls can be used to feed and, and uh, plants themselves. I've used that at UND. I, in fact, I did that in the last mission where I was the, uh, um, the um, mission leader. And we, I was impressed. We, we got some great things. Root growth from, um, so I do have a really nice <clears throat> microscope uh, there at the facility. And this is a micro basil that we grew and you can kind of see how healthy it is. You can see some of the, uh, the, the tiny little uh, uh, roots coming out, out of the sides. They're very healthy. I just threw this biosphere picture in because uh, all of the work that I've, been, that I've been doing has allowed me to uh, move out into the field. And one of the activities we went to uh, biosphere to, to just tour the facility it was spectacular, unbelievable. And also there is the, uh, is SAM, uh, it's a surface analog for Mars and Moon. And um, that's, uh, that's also probably one of the really cool parts of this project is they, uh, they really are invited, they invite everybody in, but they're <clears throat> very kind to us. I'll move on. Uh, Scott alluded to it, we had um, uh, Professor Wallace and, uh, and Professor O'Hara on the far right, and, uh, Professor Wallace on the left and Professor O'Hara on the right. And in the middle is uh, uh, mission, speci mission specialist Rose, Rosa Worku, and she is in her the spacesuit there at UND. So we got to don and off those. I think in the first mission, I was uh, four or five times, and in the um, second mission, I was four times. And move on. <laughs> Sorry, I had to do this. I did this for Scott just to kind of play around um, because Scott um, facilitates the uh, mental part of the mental health study program. And um, <clears throat> one of the really quite interesting things that I think we're discovering is if we can't tell how our crewmates feel just by looking at them, then we, we, you know, that interpersonal communication that you get, and if it's non-existent or if, you know, there's someone's unhappy, and you can't see that or feel that even, then that, that's a problem for our long-term missions. We, we've got to stay focused on that. Scott also did some really cool sleep studies on uh, the conditions inside of the uh, individual crew compartments. And, um, and then of course, uh, in our last mission, we did a really neat meditation study. And I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer in uh, taking those few moments, you know, every, every so often and just reflecting, breathing, making it really easy. And that's the last slide I had for you. Just in case, you know, not everybody knows we're going to the moon and we're going soon. And thank you and Ad Astra. I'll stick around after Nico Gassian. Thank you so much, Terry. I'm so glad we were able to make the, the technology issues work. And we, we definitely <laughs> need those images to add, I think, to the um, facial emotion recognition study. We'll have to add that to <laughs> our slide group. That's a deal. <laughs> those are awesome. <laughs> All right. Um, we're really pleased to have um, Dr. Arnold Nikogosian with us today. And um, he's going to finish up and can be our concluding speaker for the panel. And after that, we'll have our question and answer period. So um, Arnold, I'll let you take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Krishna. Let's see if I can share with you guys quickly. And I don't have it open. So bear with me just a second. Sure, no worries. Okay. There should be a green share button at the bottom. I did. Can you see it? Not yet. Okay, so we are going to share it. Let's see. share. There we go. That's working. Um, I cannot see it. Okay, can you see it? Yes. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. And uh, 
the material I'm going to present, it's adapted from our textbook. And uh, <clears throat> just to let you know, I, when I came to NASA, we had, uh, uh, you know, we, we were using uh, Antarctic uh, with the Australians, and uh, we tried to use the submarine as a model for simulation and tried to find out. Well, uh, Anari was very good, the Antarctic, and we uh, later on were funding better rest. Uh, that's the only slide I have. And uh, we used to fund better rest. This is about probably as an analog to long duration space flight. And uh, uh, the better rest uh, reduced gravity weight unloading, uh, it's a low fidelity because uh, for the first couple of days, it might simulate the shuttle cardiovascular problem, but it was too harsh environment. People move and work in space as opposed to be laying in bed on their back with their head to the ground. So I call it simulation low fidelity. So we're looking different things, and then I started to look around, and we start to fund the, the development of the EMO. Uh, uh, piggybacking on the Aquarius. And um, we look at other, um, uh, at other analogs. And uh, obviously, we build uh, rotating chamber habitats, which is high fidelity to understand gravity. The brand dies, now it's closed. And uh, microgravity, International Space Station, is high fidelity. However, it doesn't reproduce all the interplanetary radiation. So when you look at isolation, remoteness, hazard, and extreme conditions, analogs, or training, what you were calling, polar desert and underwater habitat, are good for psychological interaction, multicultural compatibility to training and studies, but does not provide microgravity and radiation exposure. It's good for also for isolation, so here are the analogs for you to look at. Microgravity, that it's a high fidelity. Isolation with the polar and whatever. Analogs, high fidelity. Uh, hypergravity is high fidelity. Then I cycle variation that we use to adapt the astronaut <laughs> for changing uh, the work schedule on, in space is a good analog because that did what they had to do, develop the night-day cycle adjustment. Space radiation spectrum simulation, it's a medium fidelity and because of limited exposure to single beam or to space station, which is sheltered in lower Earth orbit or more, or more uh, excuse me, shelter from low Earth orbit from a uh, full spectrum of the radiation. So really, uh, it uh, supports what you guys are doing. And I think those analogs are your virtue of astronaut accepting this It's a very good place to paint the um, isolation is not complete. The remoteness is not complete. But otherwise, for training and preparing people to space flight, and currently for commercial use, is very good for space tourism. That's all I have to say. Oh, I didn't overrun my time. Thank you. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, we appreciate being here and, and um, having your thoughts on analogs. Um, and what can be done well in an analog setting. Um, well, you know, I I funded a lot of those. <laughs> I, you know, my uh, bedrest days about, believe me, people are still doing bedrest, but uh, the number of bedrest that we have done is about, let's see how many we did. Uh, it's probably close to 3,000. They're expensive, there are too many experimenters and uh, really did not work the way we should, we think it should work. But occasionally it serves a good, uh, a good, um, 
test bed for testing, uh, you know, some exercise culture measures. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you. Um, we appreciate that perspective. Um, all right, well, um, that concludes the presentations and we're ready now for um, any questions that may have been put into the chat or on the Whova app. I can't see the Whova app, but um, I, I don't see any in the chat and I may, if there are any that- uh, There are in. currently no questions on Whova either. Oh, okay. Perfect. Thank you, Daniel. Well, we have a few minutes for discussion. So if anyone has any questions that they'd like to put in the chat, you're welcome to do so at this time, and we'd be happy to answer them. Uh, as the moderator, I might take advantage of this moment to start off with a question of my own for the panel. Um, so I was, um, as I listen, we're describing all of this really interesting research that, that is done in different analogs. I, I'd love to ask the group, um, what each of you believe is the most important research that can or should be done in terrestrial analogs. There's Greg Miller. So I'll oh, maybe give this one a go. Dr. Miller, can you hear me? Sure. Okay, Terry, go ahead. No, I, I I didn't hear this, the question, but it sounded really important. Oh, yeah, I don't know if it was important. Uh, the question was, what is the most important research that can or should be done in terrestrial analogs? Um, oh, I, I have a quick comment on that. Um, okay. Yeah. So I think Scott nailed it when he started doing the, um, you know, the, the health studies, if I'd like to call them that. It, lately, to me, and particularly after having a um, you know, better part of 28, almost 27 days inside the uh, the UND facility, which, by the way, is world class, and, and I've seen a lot of different analog facilities. I, I have to say, it's it's understanding who you're who you're with, what their strengths and weaknesses are, understanding the team dynamics, and. Um, and as Diallo Wallace famously said, you want to test before you invest. And the best way I can come across, you know, excuse me, get through that uh, kind of that barrier is to continue to test down here. Um, that's my opinion. Sorry, go ahead. Thank you. Thanks, Terry. Um, Scott, you were coming off mic. Did you want to add to that? Uh, it was going to be a big answer, uh, but my answer was going to be it's hard to narrow down one thing. But the NASA Human Research Program Human Research Roadmap uh, lists out the uh, the assess for risk of a lot of different areas within um, human space based research. And if you go through that list, there's going to be a lot of things that are still red, which means the risk is unacceptable for um, usually a mission to Mars. So the key, in my opinion, is to really focus in on those areas uh, that are still deemed unacceptable risk. And really test that on Earth, so that way we can really start pushing towards the next step, which we uh, to go to Mars. Thank you. That's a good point. Um, Travis or Thomas, do you want to? Yeah, we, well, on that? yeah. You know, from our from our perspective, you know, at least from an operational standpoint, is anything that will reduce the reliance upon external help. Um, anything that you can do to be more self sufficient within an analog, um, be it food growth, um, uh, generating your own water, generating your own power, anything that reduces the amount of uh, need from a from the support personnel. Um, it seems like it's, uh, it, it might be a worthwhile endeavor. That's a really good point. In an earlier panel today, we talked about the need for self-sufficiency as we push farther out, you know, on the moon, it's maybe not as critical, but, um, you know, by the time you get to Mars and farther, there's just it's gotta be self-sufficient. There's just no other way to do it. Thank you. Travis, did you wanna say something? Yeah, yeah. For my answer, I'm I'm following Scott and and Tom's sentiment there, as well as Terry's too, given I'm I'm biased in, in psychophysiology, of course. Um, but I think it's it's looking at what you're looking for, like Scott referencing the the taxonomy and the roadmap from NASA, and then finding an analog that works good for your purposes. I mean, in, in terms of control and fidelity, each analog has has pros and cons, but um, you know, they're useful test beds. I, however, am biased on the uh, the automation and and the psychosocial side um, when, you know, 
immediate live time communications just isn't feasible anymore. Um, so really gets back to that shift in the paradigm from the moon onward to Mars. Excellent. That's really true. Uh, Arnold, do you have any words of wisdom you want to share here on what you think is the most important? I need to unmute myself. You don't <laughs> want to see me that way. What is most important? I think most important to make the analogs and, um, and uh, um, simulation facilities uh, available to future uh, private astronaut and the companies so they can use it and that can provide, and you can expand those for the people to get familiar with uh, getting into space flight. Um, I didn't believe that we are going to have artificial gravity because uh, what I presented from uh, what we learned, uh, microgravity is not a good way to go. So, uh, we cannot reproduce microgravity in, on Earth except on the space station. And that's costly. We cannot reproduce radiation. So everything else can be done with analogs. And once we can start communicating that idea that analog is a good model and a good training facility, like you said, depending what you want to use it for, and create maybe an analog park next to Nemo, whatever, Aquarius, an analog part where people can go if you can get the money from the private sector, where people can go and uh, train from one analog to another, including the parabolic flight, which I'm not sure, you know, a couple of seconds, uh, how much that gives you, uh, except testing the equipment. But having a park with all the facilities there analog facilities will be a great benefit to help with uh, private astronauts and people who are going to go settle and workers, space workers, and offer it to the Air Force. I think Air Force has more money than that at this point. <laughs> Space Force, actually. Space Force. I, um, I, I think you make a really good point about um, private astronauts. We're seeing the shift to commercial and um, a shift from these highly trained military astronauts to um, you know people who can afford the price of the ticket and, and people who will be needed to do the work in space. And um, that training has got to come somewhere. I think analogs are a great place to do it. Thank you for sharing that. Um, in Let me tell you, Kristen, excuse me. Spaceport is close by. That's what people are using. We need to be close to a spaceport. Mm -hmm. And uh, having in Florida the Aquarius, Nemo, Spaceport, and several analogs there, I think that will be highly desirable as a, as a future trading part, park. It, uh, I don't think that New Mexico. Uh, launch, uh, what they call the uh, spaceport, is ideal. Nor, nor, what do you call it? The ones that you have, Kristen in Texas, uh, Elon Musk. Yeah. Uh, or whatever. Yeah, and down in, uh, it's near Boca Chica. It's, it's Boca Chica. I can't remember right. the name of the little town. It's exactly in, but um, yeah, it's unless there. Aquarius wants to put another mm -hmm. one facility next to that one, and maybe if you get enough money, you should do it. Um, in the chat, um, she roughly mentioned uh, Sian Proctor's uh, Star Harbor as well, which is another um, another area, kind of like an analog part. Um, and uh, and I'm also seeing um, Charles Peter is suggesting, in response to which um, kind of research is most important, he's suggesting plant based medicinal research, which is a great suggestion. Thank you. Um, there's a question in the chat from Michael Wallace, who says, are the projects in the analog from the students, <coughs> excuse me, from the students going, or are they brought up by others, or a bit of both? So I think he's asking, in um, in the different analog models, do, um, do the analog astronauts bring in their own research, or is there, um, are they doing research that, that other people have contributed, and they're just there as astronauts to perform that? 
So I know for the APS, for the APS analog research group, we do a little bit of both, but because we're so focused on student education and the opportunity for students to conduct research, we do make it a requirement that anybody who wants to apply to be an analog astronaut has to have their own research project to take with them and to work on on, the, on their own. So definitely a mix, but we uh, but we do make it a requirement that people do bring their own. Yeah, from from our side of the house, our experience with Nemo has been, you know, probably 75 or 80 percent of their research is in-house and, and directed. However, they're very open to collaboration over the years. We've had a number of different academic institutions with discrete projects uh, actually uh, join on with the Nemo project. So, uh, you know, we may have three astronauts and, and one scientist or engineer from from academia that actually brought this project and you know maybe more importantly brought the adequate funding to you know sort of buy their way onto the analog you know looking at what's uh, happening in the airline industry if i may uh, with all the people you know fighting with each other and whatever in close environment i think a good training for uh, social compatibility and uh, suitability and uh, multicultural uh, understanding will be very desirable. They don't get it now. The private uh, astronauts don't get that. Analogs can give it to you. And I would you say not, on only, not only learning how people live and work together, but learning how to become a team that can work seamlessly together and accomplish a mission goal. I think that's a really important part of the analog experience as well. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, well. the best example is the analog, the, the Mars analog in uh, IBMP in Moscow. They have those modules, they had the Mars analog and, uh, uh, you know, uh, they allowed alcohol actually there. And there was uh, a bad scene because there was only one international participant, which was a woman. And uh, the Russians do not invite any more women to participate in that analog. But anyhow, that, uh, you know, it happened. If you talk about analogs and uh, friction, it happens. It happens in Antarctica. So a proper training before people go and live together in a small confined environment, I think it's an important, important service can, uh, that analogs can provide. Thank you. That, that's, real, that's real interesting because, um, you know, Hollywood has, has glommed onto this, this notion and typically two or three times a year will be approached by a production company that wants to put people in these close environments and actually record and, and monitor what happens with that personal interaction. So that's sort of outside of the scope of what we would do, um, you know, from an integrity basis. But, you know, even Hollywood is a, has a, acknowledged that there's, you know, some real opportunity there. And, uh, you know, unfortunately it makes for great TV. They like that drama. Well, last year, Peresil, which is a Russian singer, uh, she's loved by all the Russians. I don't know why. But anyhow, she is a good singer. Was flown on the space station, and the Russians took a picture. She was uh, limited to the Russian segment. And the Russians, uh, for a movie, her, she and her producer for a movie, and the astronaut cast was, uh, was there. So maybe we should really try to get entertainers in uh, beyond uh, Captain Kirk uh, yeah. or uh, whatever. Uh, but uh, maybe uh, learning, you know, some of the astronauts used to play the guitar and uh, uh, transla transmit music from space. And uh, we need to look into that from the cultural standpoint and pay attention. And, and uh, there is a, place for the analogs to provide leadership in those areas, to insert art. We have science on orbit, we don't have art. 
That's true, especially for long-term competition. We're going to need to start looking at some of those factors. Um, I'm so sorry, but we do have to wrap up now. We have another panel starting in the same room in a few minutes. But I want to thank our panels again. Thank you so much for being here and for excellent presentations and for a great discussion. And thank you to everyone who attended the panel and was watching. We really appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thanks, everyone.